What's up, everyone, and welcome back to Automate It. This week, we are on episode number seven. I'm joined again by Kenton Pranav, as always. Pranav, how are you doing today, bud? Good, John. It's sunny in Seattle. Again. I had all my windows open. Yes. And I'm sweating, which is a good sign. <laughs> You're sweating. I don't know if that's a great thing, but but you know what? I'm going to say the first time you sweat, it is because like we've been waiting for summer to arrive. And so a good sweat means it's arrived. So I'm going to say that's a good thing for this day. Kent, much, yeah. How about you? In, in cold Calgary, I saw that the Rockies were getting snow. Isn't it like mid-July? What's happening? Oh, yeah. Summer's not here yet. I don't know why, but... Uh... Yeah, we don't have snow. Maybe up in the mountains they do. But yeah, I'm waiting for summer to show up here briefly before it starts to snow again. So, yeah. Right on. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Pranav, today it is your, tor- your turn to teach us again. Uh, what are you going to talk about today? Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, stateless execution in RPA. Okay. All right, so I uh, want to break that down a little bit. What's that mean exactly? Yeah, so I, th- I think the key thing that you know we want to discuss over here is uh, since uh, RPA jobs are going to run on some machines which are going to be you know running in the cloud or maybe in an on-premise network, and you're going to calling you're you're going to be calling into these RPA jobs from Power Automate. Uh, we'll share some best practices on how to architect your UI flows so they don't have any application state that they're maintaining and what's the best practices uh, to sort of scale out. So that's what you know we'll okay. be covering. Cool. I'll go ahead and I'll share my screen. Do you know what's awesome about this is that Pranav used to work for on the Redis cache team, which was all about maintaining state. And now he's going to talk to us about uh, stateless. So this is uh, <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> We're like making him go against his own rules, kind of. Yeah, Redis, Redis is all stateless. Nice. It's all in memory. <laughs> yeah, so the key things we want to think about is, uh, you know, as you're thinking about your RPA jobs, which could be opening up uh, different kind of applications like uh, SAP or websites. Uh, you, your application could be on different uh, steps. And uh, we want to be, we'll, we'll be talking about what's the best way to sort of architect the, those UI flows so that you can call them over and over again, especially from a scalable uh, perspective as you're deploying them uh, on a cluster architecture that we also saw in, in our last uh, episode. And uh, the second thing about state is around the just the state of the machine. Like, is your RPA job uh, creating any temporary files that are going to get uh, picked up by the by the next action? Uh, so that's effectively what uh, you know state is all going to be about. So it's about your application states as to where you are in your application, and then just the process state in terms of your overall process and if you're storing that state uh, in temporary files. Uh, locally on this or in an external state server as well. And to look at this uh, stateless world, you know, we'll sort of look at this uh, example, which is a customer example that we've anonymized. Uh, the scenario that over here was uh, checking delivery status uh, of each invoice. Uh, and the, the overall flow is kind of represented by this uh, like block diagram over here. The flow gets triggered when somebody you know, enters a new SharePoint request uh, saying that they want to check uh, the delivery for this invoice, which then uh, you know, updates the status to uh, say it's being processed. And then it uh, you know, initializes Excel, then it calls into SAP to check the uh, status of the invoice. So this is the UI flow that's going to launch SAP and then check the invoice status. And then it's going to drop in a PDF file which then gets picked up by this second UI flow, which takes that file and then uh, you know calls into a UPS uh, API using the PowerShell extensibility that we saw in our earlier episodes. And then it returns the result back into the flow, which then is picked up by a third API flow, which then you know puts the result into SharePoint itself. Now, if you think about this overall architecture, the flow uh, the Power Automate flow is running in the cloud. 
whereas these UI flows are running on the machine locally. Uh, and especially when you're running it in unattended mode, what happens is each time you call the UI flow, it'll create a new user session. So that means that the application that was launched will be killed. Uh, and so your UI flow is gonna run from the beginning. So in this case, I'm processing 40 invoices and I'm calling this UI flow 40 times. And as a best practice, what I've done in this UI flow is this UI flow starts all the way from recording the login step, you know, which we saw in our earlier episode. And then it looks up the invoice and then it closes the app. That way is this UI flow can run independently. And then if you want to scale this UI flow to run on a gateway cluster or a subcluster architecture that we saw in our previous episode, then you can run this UI flow independently of the other UI flows. And as an output of the UI flow, you can store that temporary file uh, in SharePoint where the second UI flow can then pick up the uh, file from SharePoint and then execute, get the status, and then sort of write the file back into, into SharePoint or OneDrive as well. So this allows you to scale like UI flow number one independently. It can have its own subcluster architecture. UI flow number two can scale independently as well. And it can have its own uh, sort of a subcluster architecture as well. And it allows you to sort of have this state which is outside of the UI flow itself. And the, the UI flow is all about just executing the steps and then being done with the processing of it where state is now sort of maintained externally from the system. And it's not being dependent on you know, a specific step or a specific activity. It also is a clean separation of concerns where now your Power Automate flow runs in the cloud. It just calls into the UI flow to, to do, do the execution locally. All the results are, you know, all the intermediate results or state is transferred back to the cloud. And then the other UI flows can sort of pick it up where now you can scale this Power Automate uh, flow itself as well, where you can sort of start playing around with the concurrency patterns and stuff to handle the load uh, from a incoming SharePoint request as well. So it gives you a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of you know, architecting for scale when you remove the state aspect from your UI flows uh, uh, itself. So I know it's a very sort of uh, complex topic. So I'll just try to summarize by, you know, if you're looking for cloud scale, try to keep your UI flows as isolated as possible and try to have state which is external to the UI flows itself. So they don't depend on that state being there. And state can be stored in different ways. You know, in this case, it was a file being shared between locally and you know stored in SharePoint. You could also stay, uh, store your state like in an external database or, or something which is not tied to, tied, tied to a UI flow itself. Uh, so key tips to remember is uh, UI flows by themselves are stateless. If you are running them in unattended mode, each execution of the UI flow will create a new user session. That means it'll kill off the previous user session, it'll kill off all the existing apps. So your UI flows should start from a clean slate and they should close the apps. Uh, do not take a dependency on the temporary files because if you're running on a clustered architecture which has uh, you know, multiple VMs running, then your UI flow can be would be uh, distributed on one of the machines using the clustering load balancing uh, algorithm that we saw in one of our previous episodes. Uh, don't depend on the app state for each execution of the UI flow. That means that you know don't assume that your app will be on step five of ten each time you call this UI flow because it'll get reset each time you call uh, into unedited mode. And just as a best practice, your UI flow should start and, and stop. Uh, that means that from a clean state, you start your application, and when you're done, you close your application. So the next instance has a has a clean uh, <clears throat> clean space uh, to, to start with. <clears throat> so that's uh, you know stateless UI flows or stateless RPA uh, in Power Automate. Do you want to go back one slide, Pranav? Yeah. So I think like what's interesting here. So like in this case, I would imagine the business process required to have this process serially, but like in situations where you could take advantage of like concurrent processing, you could have like a parallel processing branch 
and then use this stateless strategy to really improve the performance of your application, of your overall solution, because you would essentially be kicking off multiple RPA or UI flows and then being able to sort of do the scatter gather type pattern of bringing everything back in at the end um, if the business process allowed, wouldn't it? Yep, exactly. And it, it gives you very sort of uh, fine granular details uh, in terms of scaling out. You could also, you know, let's say if you're looping over here, then you can have sort of different concurrency levers that you can play, which will only apply to this specific UI flow. And since you control the subcluster architecture, you can sort of optimize it based on sort of the throughput that you expect uh, from this particular uh, step of the processing itself, which sort of gives you greater flexibility in terms of architecting uh, this particular end-to-end -end process. And this is one of the things you probably want to think about upfront before you start uh, recording your RPA scripts, uh, because it's important to record them in a way where it allows you to get the scale from a cloud perspective to meet the ROIs that have been defined for the business. Like last thing you want is like you've recorded this very complex application, you know, it takes about 100 steps and you sort of integrate into Power Automate and then suddenly you realize there's a bottleneck where now you have to redo your entire uh, UI flow or your RPA's job and it's gonna take you a lot of time to sort of re-record your scripts so it's just a best practice to think about uh, this overall stateless nature of UI flows up front uh, and see how you want to uh, think about structuring uh, the state depending on what your cluster architecture is going to be uh, as well. Yeah, that makes so sense. What do you guys think about uh, you know thinking about this from an entire platform perspective? Uh, how would this tie into like BPFs or would it tie into BPFs? Would you be able to use that to manage your, your states? I know Pranav mentioned uh, holding state in an external system. You know, could could that be in CDS to then manage business process flow stages and, and tie into that way in any clean fashion? Yes, that's a good question. Like, and that's a... Um... And that's one of the options as well, depending on what your scenarios are, right? Over here, like if your scenarios are integrating with uh, uh, sort of HR onboarding or sort of uh, business process flows uh, aspects, which are then going to call into some backend processes and stuff. Uh, yes, sort of you can use that as your uh, sort of intermediary state as well. For scenarios which do not have any business processes that they want to mimic from a BPF perspective, like this one in particular, uh, you can use to store state in a file, which is then stored in OneDrive or SharePoint on one of the sort of common locations. Uh, I've seen examples where uh, customers have been using SQL Server as their business logic. And so they've been then sort of extending SQL Server to also have state for their uh, automation scripts as well, because this is a natural extension to what they have. Uh, instead of sort of you know rebuilding an entire new state uh, store, I would say to sort of incorporate the RPA aspect as well. Um, so that's what yeah. I would. Yeah, I would say like it, it's actually interesting. I think we should cover that in an upcoming video. Is like this uh, using BPFs with RPA, and I think probably where you've got like humans involved i think bp bpfs make a lot of sense to like persist some of that state and then when you need to go out and reach out and do some ui automation then be able to kick off a ui flow to go ahead and fulfill that and then come back like i think an onboarding scenario could be a great one right where you might have like benefits enrollment as part of it you might have like system access as one you might have some sort of like code of conduct that a person needs to sign like and so the an enrollment in other programs as well and that might be a situation where it truly is staged and like every stage has a series of milestones and some of those milestones might involve kicking off an RPA process in order to complete. And then you transition it over to like the next area because maybe like they need to then execute a set of uh, activities within within that stage. So, yeah, that's that's interesting. I think we should tackle that uh, in an upcoming episode. Cool. And a, and a good sort of building block to that is also, you know, you could also imagine like this is part of your chat bot, chat chatbot solution as well, where uh, you know, there are trigger points that's going to invoke from a Power Virtual agent 
it's going to invoke power automate flow which could also then call into rpa jobs as well for back end processing and the chatbot experience could be around different kinds of scenarios again it could have these uh, 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 you know support ticket routing like scenarios or e-commerce or it could have these hr onboarding scenarios as well uh, where you would have to have this need of some way of maintaining state in the system as you're calling into these back end jobs to do the work for you cool very very cool awesome we'll have to talk about chatbots too sometime we should we should do a, an episode on chatbots for sure i think uh, that that the virtual agent stuff is extremely interesting and it seems like it's just getting easier and easier to use all the time yeah and then when you combine it with rpa it just really unlocks unlocks like you've got super modern capabilities and then you're able to address some of the perhaps legacy needs that you have in your organization or where you don't have access to apis cool all right. Well, if you guys at home think that we should do an episode on Power Virtual Agents, go ahead and leave us a comment. You all have been fantastic so far, leaving us suggestions and questions and things you'd like us to cover. And know for sure, we will cover those in upcoming episodes. We are just trying to collect a good amount right now so we can put a few more together. So keep them coming. All right, Pranav, thank you, sir, for coming and teaching us another valuable lesson today on statelessness of RPA and how to manage that. Thank you, John. Awesome. And Kent, thank you for coming and hanging out and adding commentary. And to you guys at home, thank you for watching. Go ahead and click like, click subscribe, hit that bell so that you get notified whenever a new episode comes out so that you don't miss any more goodness. That's it from us. We'll see you in the next one.